So my name is Brad. Welcome to The Way. I'm the teaching elder here at The Way. For those of you who are visiting, those who are joining us online, Randall, if you're out there, keep your eyes on the road. Uh, pay attention to your driving. Don't get distracted by Facebook, but by all means, listen to us. So I, I love being married. Uh, I was thinking about David Shea and, uh, and Mary here, and I talked a little bit about marriage last week. And I'm going to start off talking about marriage for just a minute as we get started here, because I do. I love being married. My wife and I celebrated our 17th anniversary on New Year's Eve uh, this year. I can't believe we made it 17. I can't believe she put up with me for 17 years. <laughs> so when you see her, please offer her some, uh, some congratulations in that regard. And, uh, you know, and it occurred to me as I was thinking about marriage, and for those of you who are married, you can back me up here. For those of you who aren't married, again, I'm giving you some free chicken here. You know what free chicken is? I mean, it's, good. it's a good thing. This is like free advice. That will save you. I mean, I wish to death somebody would have told me some things a number of years ago. But I didn't give my parents the opportunity to tell me some things. I just kind of called them up and said, hey, I'm getting married tomorrow, so uh, you know, congratulate me. And so I didn't give them the opportunity to, uh, you know, to afford me much in the way of instruction. But I wish that they would have. I wish that I would have done that. I wish I would have received some of that. Because marriage is the greatest thing I've ever done, I think. Uh, being a father is up there as well. But it's also one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I have messed it up a hundred times. And you're saying, well, why on earth would I listen to somebody give me advice about something that they mess up all the time? And well, who else to take advice from but somebody who's messed it up all the time? And you got my permission to talk to Amy to see how I've messed it up all the time. She'll tell you. I promise. She wouldn't tell you. Uh, I promise. I'll tell you that. But uh, I have. I have messed it up a hundred thousand times. But I love being married. And I want to have a great marriage. I don't want to have a good marriage. I want to have a great marriage. And, and we have a great marriage. I want to keep a great marriage. And it has occurred to me, though, that one of the main things that impact marriages is neglect and passivity. You do not drift in your affections. You will never drift in your love toward anyone. It requires work. You gotta water that relationship with time, with commitment, with love. You gotta water that relationship with all of those things so that it can be a great relationship. God loves the institution of marriage. He loves it. He created it. It's a model of the gospel. And Jesus himself, quoting the Old Testament, says, Let no man separate that which God has joined together. Divorce. Uh, everybody, everybody in here has been impacted by divorce in some way. There are a few things that tear people up the way divorce does. Uh, either you're divorced yourself, you're married to somebody that's been divorced, your parents may have been divorced, you've got a friend that was divorced. Every single person in this room has been impacted by divorce in some way. In some way. And I tell you, I've seen it over the years. Uh, you know, it normally happens in a way like this. You know, there may be a dramatic event in some way, but normally people just drift. You know, if I forget Valentine's Day this year, my wife will still be my wife. If I forget our anniversary, she will still be my wife. If I forget to tell her how much I love her tomorrow, she will still be my wife. If I forget to give her a hug when she's feeling down, she will still be my wife until she's not my wife anymore. We drift away. And unless we are intentional, unless we are deliberate in watering that relationship with commitment and time and love, it has no choice but to drift. And in much the same way, our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, requires deliberation. So if you are with me, please flip to the book of Revelation chapter 2 as we continue our study titled First Love. I'm entitled, and, and I really think it's more of a season in our church, this season of pursuing our first love. And I've entitled today's message from good to great. From good to great. I don't want to be in a good church. I don't want our church to be a good church. I want our church to be a great church. The issue comes in how do we measure greatness. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. So if you remember, John is on the island of Patmos, 
towards the end of his life, and he's there, and he's in exile. We, we learned last week from chapter 1 on the account of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he's proclaiming the gospel, and he's put into exile as an old man on this island, and you can bet that it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a nice place to be. It's not like he was enjoying himself on the island of Patmos. And then he's, it says that he's in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He's in the Spirit on the day of the Lord, and he hears this voice behind him. And this voice is like a trumpet. We read later, it's like the sound of rushing water. And this voice says, write these things down. And so he turns to see who this voice is that's speaking to him. This voice that is like a trumpet. And it says that he sees one like the Son of Man. And this one like the Son of Man is in between these seven gold lampstands. We learn that this is the church. And he has this amazing vision of the glorified Christ. Jesus as he's never been seen before in all of his power and his glory and his majesty and his response to the revelation of who Jesus is, he falls to his face as if he's dead. He falls to his face in fear of the Lord and the awe of the Lord. But Jesus comes to him and puts his hand on his shoulder and says, fear not and then he speaks to him, starting in verse 1 of chapter 2. And these are, the, these are the words that he commanded him to write down. So starting in chapter 2 of verse 1, words of Jesus to John. says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil. And your patient endurance. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. And found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently. And bearing up for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. But I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore... From where you have fallen. Repent. And do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans. Which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers. I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Which is in the paradise of God, and so I pray that we would all have a spirit to hear this morning, that our ears would be inclined to hear the words of God to his church in Ephesus as we talk about going from good to great. So the church at Ephesus uh, is one of the first churches that was ever founded. Ephesus was a, a large kind of metropolitan city, uh, maybe Nashville, I don't know, uh, but it was a pretty large city in those days. And it was known for a couple of things. There was commerce. Uh, it was a postal center for the Roman Empire. What Ephesus was really known for was the temple to Artemis. They had a large temple to the goddess Artemis, who became the goddess Diana once the Romans co-opted the Greek gods and goddesses. And, and that was what much of the city revolved around was the worship of the goddess Artemis. In this temple, in and around this temple, much of the activity of the city revolved around that. The book of Acts tells us about the founding of the church in Ephesus. So Paul, he's on his second missionary journey, and he's traveling, and, and he decided he wanted to go to Asia, take the gospel to Asia. It tells us that the Holy Spirit prevented that from happening. He's called to go to Europe instead, and so he does. He goes to Europe, he goes to Greece, he goes to Thessalonica, he goes to Berea, he goes to Athens, he ends up in Corinth. And in Corinth, he meets our friends Priscilla and Aquila that we talked about a number of weeks ago. And they plant the church in Corinth. And he spends about a year and a half in the city of Corinth ministering before he says, Hey, i got to go back to Antioch. i got to go back home and tell everybody back home what's been going on. And so they, they, they leave Antioch. He takes Priscilla and Aquila with him. On the way there, they end up in the city of Ephesus, recorded in Acts chapter 18. And he spends a very short period of time in Ephesus. He preaches a time or two there. And then he leaves to go back to Antioch to go home. But he leaves Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. Well, Priscilla and Aquila do what they do. They continue to minister, to, to build up this church that they've planted in Ephesus. 
at one point, our man Apollos comes through, and Apollos is preaching with power and authority. He's got some stuff wrong, though, so Priscilla and Aquila take him aside. They correct Apollos in some of his teachings. He receives that correction, and then they send him on to Corinth, where he goes to build up the church they had planted there. Meanwhile, Paul takes it upon himself to go on his third missionary journey to visit all the churches he had visited before, and he ends up in Ephesus once more, where he links up with Priscilla and Aquila. Now, he corrects some teachings that they had there. They were still a little bit off in some of their teachings, and he stays there about two to three years preaching in first the synagogue and then the hall of Tyrannus. There's some interesting events that occur while he's in Ephesus. Uh, if you consider, there were these silversmiths. And one of the things they did was they made statues to the goddess Artemis. And so this is how they made money. And at some point, you know, Paul and his companions are preaching Christ and him crucified. So they begin to impact the bottom line of these silversmiths. And they get upset because they're having less money. And so they actually, a silversmith named Demetrius actually stirs up the other silversmiths into a riot. There's actually a riot and they drag Paul's command companions before this mob and they're going to do some damage to them uh, before uh, another person stands up and kind of uh, quells the mob a little bit. And so eventually the riot is quelled. Paul ends up leaving. He continues on his journey. At some point, he feels called back to Jerusalem, and he wants to see the elders from Ephesus one more time. So he stops in the port city of Miletus. He sends for the elders of Ephesus, it's recorded in Acts chapter 20, and they come to him. And he gives them this impassioned speech, recorded in Acts chapter 20. And at the end of the speech, it says that, that when they heard these things, they knelt down and they prayed together. There was weeping on the part of all. They, they embraced Paul and they kissed him. They loved him. And they were sorrowful most of all because of the words he had spoken that they would not see his face again. He's going back to Jerusalem. He believes he will be taken into custody by the Romans and that he will never see them again. And so they're grieving. They're crying about not seeing their brother Paul again. And that's exactly what happens. Paul goes back to Jerusalem. He's taken into Roman custody and, and they work him up the chain of custody. And he ends up back in Rome is where he ends up. In Rome, he writes a letter to the church in Ephesus. Letter of Ephesians. Listen to what he says about the Ephesian church in Ephesus chapter, or Ephesians chapter 1. He says, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Think about the church in Ephesus. This was a church that was founded by the Apostle Paul. What more solid of a foundation could you have than to be founded by the Apostle Paul? This was a church that was watered by the teachings of great early men and women of God, Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos. Paul actually wrote the letter, 1 Corinthians, to the church at Corinth from Ephesus. He was in Ephesus in this good church, writing a letter to the church in Corinth that was a jacked up church. If you ever want to see a jacked up church, you look to the church in Corinth, to the Corinthians. This was a church that was founded upon all of these principles that had Paul even correcting the things that they believed. And then we get a few years later and we get this letter from Jesus through John to them in which he says all of these things that we just read only about 20 to 30 years later depending upon when you date this letter John says to them he says from Jesus he says I know your works they've been working hard they've been doing good things they've been laboring on behalf of the gospel they've been toiling it doesn't say what they did maybe they were feeding the poor maybe they were taking care of orphans and, and widows as we're commanded to do maybe they were laboring on behalf of the gospel maybe they were proclaiming maybe they were making disciples of all the nations as we're made. he says i know this he says i know that you've been working hard you've been toiling you've had patient endurance 
Why did they need endurance? Well, in those days, there was specified persecution against the church. You know, it wasn't specified at first. You know, originally the Romans couldn't tell the difference between the Jews and the Christians. And then when they could finally distinguish the difference, and the difference was... The difference was that the Jews rebelled against the Roman governmental authorities. Christians did not. That's what distinguished them. And when they could finally tell, there was specified universal persecution against Christians. It was government policy. And John says to them, I know you've been working. I know you've been enduring. He says, I know you cannot bear those who are evil. We're called to be pure ourselves. We're called to protect the purity of the church. And he says, I know that you've been doing these things. I know you have tested those who are apostles, who say they're apostles and are not, and found them to be false. From 1 John, he talks about the Antichrist who are already in the world. Jude tells us about the people who come to slander and pervert the grace of God. We've got to discern who those people are. We've got to protect the flock, the people of God, from people who would teach us false things. He says, I know that you've been doing that. You've been tested. You are bearing up. You are enduring patiently for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. But... I told you my favorite word in the Bible is but. My least favorite word in the Bible today is but. He says, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. This was a good church, a good church full of good people doing good things. He says, but I have this against you that you have abandoned your first love. Abandon is an interesting word here. It literally means, uh, elsewhere it's used in scripture, to leave, to walk away. Physically is what that word means. We'll do some, uh, some grammar geekery here for just a second. So it is a second person singular verb. You. Anybody do Latin? <laughs> Nobody does Latin? Memphis, raise your hand. Memphis does Latin. David, raise your hand. You do Latin. It's a second. <laughs> It's a second person singular verb, meaning he's not saying y'all, he's saying you, the church. This is a church issue. It's a collective issue. It's a collaborative issue. The church collaborated in abandoning their first love. The leaders led and the people followed. That's the way it always is. That's the way it happens. The Presbyterian denomination is one of the oldest and, and most conservative denominations in America. Uh, interestingly enough, during the, the, the Civil War, uh, the Presbyterian denomination is one of the few denominations that stood against slavery. Southern Baptists, Baptists did not, but the Presbyterian denomination did. One of the greatest old denominations that there are in the American church some point a number of years ago, 30 or 40 years ago, the leaders of the Presbyterian denomination started off by denying the inerrancy and sufficiency of Scripture. It always starts with that. It always starts with denying the inerrancy and sufficiency of God's Word. And they began to lead the people away from their first love, from the truth. Now, some of the people followed some of the people did not, and that is why there is the PCA and the PCUSA in the American Presbyterian Church. That is why there are two Presbyterian denominations. I think there's even more mutations of it than that. Now, but the leaders led and the people followed, and that's the way it always happened. He says, I know that you did all of these amazing and wonderful things. You did all that I called you to do. These are all good things. These are all things that we should be doing. But I have this against you. I have this against you. You abandoned. You walked away from your first love. If you're a leader, you led the people away from your first love. If you're one of the people, you followed that leader away from your first love. This is a collective issue. It's a collaborative issue of the church. At one point, our faith was so easy, wasn't it? <laughs> Uh, I got to hear on Friday night at uh, Celebrate Recovery some testimony, amazing testimony. I love, y'all like hearing testimonies? I, I love hearing, and isn't it amazing that 
Every single testimony has the same story, if you think about it. God saves sinners. I'm a great sinner in need of saving. Amen. I mean, every single testimony has that as its theme. But I got to hear this testimony on Friday that was amazing, and I'm always stirred in some way by testimony. So think about your own testimony for just a minute. Think, think about your own testimony, your own walk with the Lord. When did that walk start? Maybe you got a boring testimony. <laughs> is there such a thing as a boring testimony? Maybe your testimony is like this. Like I pray that Benjamin and Melody's testimony is. Maybe you were brought up in the way of the Lord. Maybe you were raised up in the church. Maybe your parents poured into you to make disciples out of you. And at some point you repented of your sin and you became. A, maybe you don't even remember when that happened. It was so long ago. But you know that it happened and you've been faithfully in serving the Lord ever since that happened. Maybe, that's your, te maybe your testimony is textbook and that would have all praise and glory and honor be unto him for that. Maybe you're an adult convert like me. Maybe you became faith in Christ as an adult like me. And so your testimony looks a little different. But remember back to when you first got saved to how easy things were. I didn't know anything. I knew nothing. I didn't know anything about theology. I didn't know anything about ecclesiology, the church. I didn't know anything about how to walk as a Christian, how to live as a Christian, how to work as a Christian. I didn't know anything about the enemy. I didn't know anything about spiritual warfare. I knew one thing and one thing alone. I knew that God saves sinners and that I was a great sinner in need of saving. It was so easy back then. And sometimes we talk about childlike faith and I even resist using that phrase sometimes because I think that people use that as a crutch to, 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 to make excuses as to why they don't pour into the deep things of God, why they don't consume the meat of Scripture to teach us the hard things about God. But childlike faith, there's something to be said about the simplicity of loving Him who loved us first. What drove the Ephesian church to fall away, to abandon? It doesn't say what that was. Was it pride, perhaps? I know in, in our theological circles, so, you know, I, I consider myself reformed in my, re my view of salvation as I cling to the doctrines of grace. I don't even know what reformed theology is. It's just theology. It's the Bible teaching us about God. But there are many in my theological circles, in our theological circles, because you're in this church right now, who at some point become prideful about knowing what we think to be the truth and look down our noses at those who don't necessarily believe the exact same way that we believe, even though they claim to the, the truth that God saves sinners through the shed blood of Christ on the cross. We look down at them in arrogance and we abandon our first love for theology. Which is a good thing. We ought to love theology. We ought to love the study of God. What is it that pulled the Ephesian church away? Was it passivity? Was it neglect? <clears throat> Did they neglect their relationship with the risen Lord Jesus? Their love for the Jesus? For Jesus? Because remember, we will never drift toward Jesus. But what are we to do in this case? Fortunately, John tells us what to do. Look with me, if you will, to chapter or to verse four, verse five. John tells us, he says, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. You, you either followed or you led as a collective church. You fell away from the Lord Jesus and your love that you had at first for him. You had it. <clears throat> you fell from it. But then he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Remember and repent. This is the Recipe for restoration. That's a lot of alliteration this morning. My Southern Baptist roots are showing. I apologize for that. Let's talk about remembering for just a minute. Let's talk about remembering. A brother of mine gave me this verse earlier in the week. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm going to read it to you. It's not going to be on the screen. This is right after the Shema that we just read for Benjamin and Melody. This is right after this. 
God talking to them about when, when they come into the promised land. And he says that when the Lord your God brings you into the land, that he swore to you, he promised you he was going to give you this land. And he gives you great and good cities. That you didn't, He's going to give you cities. You didn't even build these cities. He's going to give you homes. You didn't even build these homes. He's going to give you vineyards and olive trees that you didn't even plant. He's going to give all of this to you. And when you eat and you're full, take care lest we forget. How could we possibly forget? We just lived in a house that we didn't even build. We just lived in a city that God gave to us. I just went and got some food out of the vineyard and out of the plants that I didn't even plant. How could we possibly forget? Well, he tells us to take care lest we forget, meaning we will forget if we are not deliberate about reminding ourselves. I was particularly moved this week by a reading out of our one year Bible study reading plan, which are back there on the table, by the way, it's my plug, if you want to get one on your way out, feel free to join in with us, not too late. Hagar is a slave girl given by her mistress to Abraham to have a child because she is not able to. It's Sarah's idea. Men, it is sometimes okay to disobey your wives. <laughs> this would have been one of those instances where it probably would have been okay for Abraham to say, Honey, I love you. It's a great idea. I'm not going to do that. But he did. <laughs> and so Hagar conceives a child. She expresses contempt toward Sarah, her mistress. And so Sarah obviously becomes angry and she runs her off. She sends her and she sends her out on her own. This is a young girl, Hagar, maybe you know, in those days much younger, 17, 16, 15. She's pregnant by herself in the wilderness. It's dangerous for a young girl in those days. And at some point it says that she's by a string of water in the wilderness, lying, fetal position, doesn't know what to do. The angel of the Lord comes to her commands her to return and submit makes a promise to her I will multiply your offspring and so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her you are a God of seeing or another rendering that I like that's equally as valid that I like you are a God who sees me he is a God who sees you. He is a God who sees you. It's his name, El Ra. He is a God who sees you as we remember who he is. He's always seen you. He saw you from eternity past. He decided to create you to call you, to save you, to ordain a work for you, and you, and you, all of us, all of you. He is a God who sees you and me. This is who he is. It is in his name. He is a God who sees, and he is a God who loves. First John chapter 4 tells us that he is love. And when I consider how much he loves us from Romans chapter 5 verse 8, that while I was yet a sinner, he died for us. While I was a hater of God, while I hated God and everything and rejected everything about him, he died on the cross for me. And not only that, he died on the cross knowing my sins past, but he died on the cross knowing my sins future. He died for me on the cross knowing that every single day for the rest of my life, I would betray him. It would be like going to a wedding, looking your wife or your future husband in the eye, knowing that they would commit adultery on you every single day for the rest of their lives and still saying, I do. That's the extent of how much he loves me. And his greatest desire for us is not that we do, but that we love. 
Because if we do and we're not loving, we're sinning, is what this text tells me right here. You don't believe me? What is the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods other than me. The second commandment, thou shalt not make an idol. Thou shalt reserve thy worship and love primarily for him and him alone. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus quotes Hosea who says, I desire steadfast love. Not sacrifice. I don't really care about sacrifice. You can do no work for the rest of your life. You can take the one year Bible plan out back and burn every single one of them. You can do no work at all. You can never come to church again if you're not loving Jesus. If you're not loving Jesus. We got to remember. We got to remind ourselves of this truth every single day. You say, why do we preach the same gospel over and over and over again? Well, it's because I will walk in and live in a house that does not belong to me. I will live in a city that I didn't build. I will eat fruit from a tree that I didn't plant. And I will forget who gave all of those things to me. I'll forget it five minutes from now. I'll forget it a minute from now. I've got to remind myself of this truth every single day, every second, every minute of the day. I've got to remember. And then I've got to repent. Isn't it interesting that the recipe is the same? Whether you are of Christ or not of Christ. A person that's not a follower of Christ. What must I do? Repent. Turn from your sin. A person of Christ. I don't know what to do. I'm struggling. I don't, I don't know what's going on in this situation. What do I do? Repent. Turn from your sin. Get to your knees. What do we repent of? Maybe we need to repent of our good works. <laughs> I mean, is that not... Kind of an oxymoron thing to think about. I mean, that sounds like some army stuff right there. I got to repent of my good works. I got to repent of all the good things I've done. I read the Bible completely. I read it twice last year. I come to church every single Sunday. There's not a single time that the church doors aren't open. I got to repent of that. I show up, man, a cafe, I hand out more food than anybody else does. And whenever the church has a need, I tithe twice a week. I tithe twice a month. We got to repent of that. If we have forgotten our first love. None of that matters. None of that matters. And so how do we respond to that? How do we respond? Where do we go from here? How do you invest in your relationship with your wife? Time. I'm reminded, brother gave me another passage this week. Jesus in Mark chapter 1. Our model tells us that he's up late one night and he's healing people. Casting out demons, doing things that Jesus does. And a lot of people know he's doing that, so people are coming. And he's up late doing that. You say, well, I don't have time. I don't have time. Jesus is up late doing these things. And it says, he got up early the next morning. He got up early the next morning. He forsook the self-indulgence of sleep. He was tired. But he got up early to go be with his father. Because that was his first love. That was his love. He models for us what it is we are to do. We've got to get alone with God. We've got to meditate on God's word about God. We've got to get alone with him and his word. We've got to spend time with him primarily. Let that be the primary work that we do of loving God. Of loving Jesus. If you do nothing else this year. If you do nothing else this year. Do this. Do this. Second thing, we've got to do this in community. We've got to do this in community. Author Hebrews tells us to exhort one another every day so that none of us will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. As we drift from Jesus, as our hearts get hardened toward Jesus. And maybe we're not drifting from Jesus. Maybe we're being driven from Jesus. Maybe there's circumstances in our lives that are pushing us away from Jesus. Maybe there's hard things happening in our lives that are causing us to question Jesus. And we don't know why. And our hearts have become callous and hardened. May we look around in the fellowship and the community of the church. And exhort one another, brother, I know that you've been struggling. I see you're struggling. I feel and I fear that your heart may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Allow me to help remind you 
Let me, uh, let me help you remember who God is, who Jesus is. He is a God who sees you. He's a God who sees you, and he is a God who loves you, and he will love you every day for the rest of your life. So Joe's going to sing, time of invitation, time of response. What then will you do? And I'm not saying this is where our church is. I don't know. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? I mean, I've seen this happen in marriages so many times. You know, people are married 10, 20, 30 years. And at some point, they stop remembering their first love. They have children. It comes about the children. It comes about the things they do. These are all good things that we do, right? At some point, it becomes about those things. And you forget to invest in your wife. You forget to water that relationship with time, with commitment, with love, with energy, with all of these other things. And before long, you're married to your roommate. You look at your wife, and she's a stranger. She's your roommate. She happens to cohabitate with you. And then the children grow up and leave. And where to go from there? What if they could rewind 10 years, 20 years, 15 years, and water that relationship with all of the things that will nourish it, that you know what they are? I pray that we would never wind up there with the Lord. Say, look at all these things that we did. He said, you have forgotten and abandoned your first love. And again, I pray in doing this, this season in our church that we would never get to that situation, that we would remember before we get into this situation. So again, if, where are you at? If you need to come and pray with me, I'll be down front. Pray right where you're at. You can pray anywhere, obviously. But let us remember our first love today. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we love you. We do. I proclaim that this morning. I proclaim that today. God, forgive me. Forgive me for the countless times I've abandoned that love. I've forgotten that first love. God, forgive me for every single day when I forget about that love. Forgive me when I interact with my children having forgotten about that love. Forgive me when I interact with my wife having forgotten about that love. And so, God, we remember this morning who you are. God who sees me. Mm. I cling to that. In my highs, my lows, in the valleys, pits of despair, the drudgery of daily life, on the mountaintops. God, you are a God who sees me and loves me. Mm. I cling to that this morning, and I remember that. God, remind us often. Surround us with brothers and sisters of Christ who remind us. God, I pray for this body of believers. The way. God, I pray that we would never forget our first love. That we would never abandon our first love. God, that we would always remember you. That you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. The sins of all who would believe. And so, God, we claim that love this morning. We remember that love. Forgive us for the times that we'll forget. I'll forget this afternoon. God, forgive me. I'll forget tomorrow. God, forgive me. Remind me. We love you. We praise you. We ask all these things in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. We stand as we sing.